All right. I want to talk with you in this video about a very recent book. This book was published last month. Now we are in July, July 2024. This book was published in June 2024. Uh, the book is titled Phenomenological Psychology as Rigorous Science, alluding to a famous essay by Edmund Husserl, Philosophy as a Rigorous Science. The book is written by Alexander Nikolai Vent, who is, I believe, uh, currently a postdoctoral researcher in psychology at the Sigmund Freud University in Vienna and at another institution, uh, Ruprecht Karls University in Heidelberg. His research focuses on psychology of thought, theoretical psychology, and philosophy of science. This book, if you just look superficially at the publisher publisher's material, uh, it says that it is written uh, for philosophers who are interested in psychology and psychologists who are interested in what? Psychologists who are interested in psychology, but in a different way, in a philosophical way. People who are interested in psychology and its philosophical foundations, presuppositions. And phenomenology has a lot to do with that, with uncovering that those, those foundations. I would add one more thing here. If you're interested in pluralism, philosophy of science with a pluralistic attitude, and at the same time you have some interest in psychology, then you should read this book. The book is quite short. I don't know why I read it on Kindle, and the page numbers are uh, not the same. So on Kindle, uh, it tells me that it is more than 200 pages long, but if you uh, look at the PDF or look at the print edition of the book, it's less than 200 pages. It's 160, 180 pages. I don't know why there is that mismatch, but regardless, if I give you page numbers now in this video, they refer to the, my uh, Kindle where I read the, read the book. So let me read a little bit. I might add my own commentary, but uh, I'll, I would like to read, give you a flavor of what this book is about, what, it's, what it offers. Uh, first, I have selected a couple of passages about the task of the book, what the book is about, what it wants to do. Okay, this is from page 17. Uh, we read, the main claim is that the scientific discipline of psychology needs to be more rigorous to attend to its foundational problems, which permeate all empirical research and surface in crises throughout its history. So these problems are not as specialist problems, problems that some people have these esoteric interests because they have maybe some personality flaws. That's why they need to go to those foundational questions. It's not about that. It's problems that really are present, they permeate, but they become more visible only in crises and in by the way, in the second chapter of the book, which I uh, found very interesting, there is that argument that what many people talk about as crises might be better described as stagnation, uh, the failure of moving forward, the failure to make, make progress or accomplish anything. That's a, it looks like it is a crisis, deadlock, but in fact, it's a repetition of a failure that keeps happening maybe changes in appearance. Okay, I'm jumping forward in um, on my Kindle. This is on page uh, 214, I think, concluding chapter. Uh, here we read, the potential and the, and the promise of phenomenological psychology are to advance theoretical psychology by providing it with a rigorous discourse on foundation. So what is uh, rigor? What is what, is, what do we mean by rigorous? We don't mean exact. We don't mean uh, mathematically precise modeling. What we mean is the ability to speak about the foundation of, of psychology. This is a very psychoanalytic theme. Our author here, uh, Alexander Vent, Alexander Nikolai Vent, he, he doesn't bring in Freud to the, as, as far as I remember. He does refer to the phenomenological tradition and, and Husserl he is a postdoctoral fellow at the Sigmund Freud University. That I don't think that's a coincidence. But this uh, rigor meaning 
the ability to speak about something that is at the foundation. That is a really, uh, it's a genuine psychoanalytic project when it is applied to people. So this could be a analogous, uh, compared to analogous to a kind of psychoanalysis of a scientific discipline. Okay, reading from page 166. Its most important function, the most important function of phenomenological psychology or phenomenology when applied to psychology. The most important function is to demonstrate that all psychologically relevant acts are meaningful and cannot be understood independently of the subjective conditions of their constitution. Cannot be understood, in other words, separate from their, uh, their context, which makes them meaningful. So this is, uh, if you think about this statement, it's, uh, it moves against the laboratory, psychological laboratory, which is, uh, which is the attempt to isolate a psychological phenomenon. And that isolation neglects the fact that these uh, psychologically relevant acts or facts, they are meaningful. They are meaningful because they are connected. They are, they are grounded in their situation. This passage that I uh, read is a place where uh, our author is reviewing uh, the works and contributions of some other phenomenologists. In that chapter, he is tracing a few, uh, a few different movements in the history of philosophy, history of phenomenology. Many of these movements failed to continue, uh, failed to pass on to the next generations, uh, at least in the, in, the, in the way they were originally conceived as a phenomenological project. Uh, he talks about worldviews being necessarily connected with, with, with psychology, psychological projects, psychological questions. They are connected to worldviews, even though those worldviews are not always uh, talked about. So we read uh, page 24. Psychological arguments and claims based on alternative worldviews can only be represented, addressed, or criticized if these worldviews are epistemologically accessible. This suggests that psychology would be able to attend to its problems more reliably if it was cognizant of its own and other worldviews, alternative, possible alternative worldviews. The idea of psychology as rigorous science is to provide such an epistemological background, a discourse on foundation. Again, the ability uh, to speak, being encouraged to have this discourse. This might be, this might be of interest. This, uh, the, the psychologist of department in my own former career in, in academic psychology, which lasted uh, from 2010 when I started my master's um, program and then PhD. Uh, so 2010 until my postdoc at Leiden University. And uh, I was an assistant professor of psychology for five years. Um, I think five years, five, five six years. Uh, in all of those departments, there were people who uh, had power. They could make decisions about other people's careers. And when there was, especially at, at the University of Toronto, where there were people who were, who were dissidents, they, they thought differently, they had a different, a more philosophical orientation. People who were in power, people who were in charge, what they did was they, they uh, disallowed those types of discourse. They systematically excluded and isolated the person, one, two, how many, the minority, who didn't have the same amount of power. Maybe one of them had tenure. But people in charge did, that, did not engage in discourse. They repressed. They translated their, their institutional power to determine what can be included in the conversation about psychology, what psychology is, where it can go, where it should go, and the types of conversation that uh, is excluded, what is included, what is excluded. So uh, what this book is arguing for is an open, a more open discussion, uh, discourse that can address. At, at first, it allows itself to learn how to have this discourse and then continues. But of course, it, it needs the chance to learn. Uh, you can't just start and words just come out and you, everything go, works well. Uh, so. Awareness of worldview. Uh, that, that awareness of worldview, the att attention to that foundation as a foundation of psychological projects, 
uh, translates to rigor. When what you're doing in psychology as a psychologist is connected uh, to uh, the foundational presuppositions. You have epistemological access to those presuppositions. And that gives you a different kind of attitude, or as our author says, a different kind of orientation. It gives you orientation. Again, on page 24, we read, the more orientation uh, the research has, the more rigorously it can be exercised. Being phenomenological, psychology would be equipped with a foundational discourse as self-critique. One of the benefits of rigor, one of the features of rigor is um, moving towards uh, integration, synthesis, uh, common, common ground. So on page, I'm skipping to page 39, we read, Rigor strives towards integration, which is a holistic motif of Husserl's uh, search for absolute foundation. It articulates the connectedness between the, the domains of the different domains of knowledge. Hence, uh, rigor solicits formal ontology. Uh, I can't really unpack that here in this short video. Uh, but that is essentially a justification for why formal ontology is, is needed. Rigor will here be understood as a meta-attitude, an attitude in which other attitudes become uh, thematic, become thematized. One may call it an art of radical questioning. This allows a systematic analysis of the otherwise tacit foundations of research. Thus, rigor allows science to emancipate from its presuppositions. Again, very psychoanalytic. Rigor allows science to emancipate from its presuppositions, to be able to detach from these presuppositions and examine them, uh, which is the same thing as having a discourse on the foundations of the science. Uh, another thing that our author here argues for is uh, the benefit of phenomenology for having debates and disagreements that then become productive, that lead somewhere. Uh, we read, rigorously founded psychology, this is uh, 55, page 55, 56. Rigorously founded psychology is able to systematize its own controversies, to understand the meaning behind the conflicts of, for example, structuralism and functionalism, behaviorism and communism, Association, associationism and gestural psychology. What do these disagreements mean other than saying that the other side is wrong? What is that? Is there a common ground on which all these uh, participants in these debates are standing? What is that common ground? What are the things that they agree and what are the things exactly that they disagree on? I have a paper now, I think it feels like a long time ago, in which I argue that behaviorism and uh, structuralism, they share a lot of important similarities and that cognitive psychology continues <laughs> a commitment to these similarities that these two movements share in common. Anyways, uh, continue. let's continue. Rigor can stabilize. So rigor can stabilize the scientific discourse without having to unify, without, without demanding that um, we should all agree on these on these issues without having to unify or rather standardize uh, these discourses. Instead of Thomas Kuhn's motif of paradigms and their hegemony, the state of a discourse can be described according to Ludwig Fleck's concept of thought styles. I'm not familiar with uh, Ludwig Fleck uh, and thought styles, but reminds me, this reminds me of Ian Hacking and uh, his notion of styles of reasoning. Anyways, Again, it enables a more pluralistic approach rather than having to search for hegemony. And when hegemony is absent, we are pre-paradigmatic. Um, so thought styles, unlike paradigms, do not entail predominance. As long as the dynamics within a science depend on social cohesion or on consensus, following whatever the chair of the department says, or the dean. Uh, pluralism is an obstacle in those, in those scenarios. This is the case in non-rigorously founded discourses. 
the, co uh, the coordination of various thought styles becomes possible if the foundation is secured. Jumping a little bit, as a, as a consequence, the, prim uh, the primary effective difference between rigorous and non-rigorous sciences, between rigor and non-rigor, is that rigorous science is able to endure and even seize discursive tension, seize differences, debates. Phenomenology can provide a substructure for science that allows it to integrate its imminent contradictions without having to simplify them. End quote. Okay. So, um, yeah, I was very curious about this book. I enjoyed reading it a lot. I, I would recommend it, but, but the thing that uh, Alexander Nikolai Vent is here arguing for is much, much harder to do than to argue for its necessity. So that's, uh, we should keep that in mind because that uh, thing, in my, in my opinion, can only be done if you are actually connected to the scientific uh, activities. If you pick one or two scientists, concrete scientific projects that are actually happening, then connect them to your you know, phenomenological substructure. Um, if you have access to epistemological access to the foundation without losing access to the concrete um, social reality, including the research projects, psychological research projects. That's, that's incredibly difficult. I tried to do that in my first book, Experimental Psychology and Human Agency, but my knowledge of phenomenology and the phenomenological tradition uh, was not sufficient. My knowledge of uh, empirical research, experimental psychology was, I think, strong. I did, um, I did do extensive research, but uh, I, um, I mean, because of my background and because I actually wanted to finish this writing project, I couldn't um, go away and study phenomenology for 10 years, six years. Um, I did it to the extent that I could. And maybe this should bring me to another point here, that uh, what phenomenologists uh, can do, now I'm not saying should, but people who are interested from a, from a philosophical background, from a phenomenological background, what they can do, instead of only reading their own, um, their own material, their own references, their own tradition, and then the represent representatives of the you know the most successful uh, representations of empirical research. What they could do is instead also look for internal criticism and self critiques within psychology that is done by psychologists who are in the in the periphery, in the minority, who are struggling uh, to be represented to to become predominant. Uh, prominent, predominant. Um, I think that is a that could be a very productive alliance to see what is happening in psychology. How psycho there's already um, tensions within psychology, and how those tensions, how we can make sense of those tensions uh, with the help of phenomenology. Otherwise, if we don't do that, phenomenology will be an import, and it has to be justified a priori without really paying attention first to. Um, and as Wendt here argues, that that's, that might result in what Husserl did, which was essentially trivial, trivializing, give, um, having a, an, attitude towards, uh, an attitude towards psychology as a trivial discipline compared to phenomenology. And so psychology might be resistant towards that. But instead, another path, an alter, uh, one possible path among many, is to find tensions, disagreements, that already exist and make sense of them. Regardless, this was a fun book to read, um, even for a person like me who's outside of academia right now. Um, if you are in psychology, if you care about the philosophy of psychology, if you're curious about uh, phenomenological psychology and its contribution to philosophy of science, I would recommend this book. Um, that's it. Take care of yourselves. Talk to you next time.